Hello, I'm Marwan. I'm Devin. I'm Phoenix. And welcome to The Wasteland and the Mountain, where we discuss the state of the left, analyze where it's gone awry, and together envision a path forward from the wasteland and towards the mountain. In our prior episode, we began to paint a better picture of our politics through discussing concepts and matters like the left's distrust of authority, how different conceptions of freedom can impel or repel people towards solidarity, how postmodernism and identity politics not only lessen the voices of the marginalized, but actively harm the working class solidarity needed to create a better society where everyone can be universally recognized as self-actualized people. We also touched on the notions of an atheistic left and whether those notions were historically accurate and how spiritual left movements might find themselves closer to a more comprehensive vision of left politics than those who deride any notion of religion or spirituality. Today, following our episode last week, we'll be zooming in further on some of the topics discussed in our prior episode to diagnose the problems the left faces and to further clarify our overall politics and begin to etch out a new way forward for the left. So we'll start by um, addressing uh, a number of questions. And the first being, how have postmodern notions of social justice and corporate wokeism subverted challenges to the ruling class and transformed social justice into a tool of predatory capitalism? Phoenix, you had thoughts on this one? Yeah, well, I think that the traditional left had uh, an emphasis on how wealth was going to be distributed, and they had a natural skepticism towards corporate power. Um, that was the narrative that really drove it. Um, but it really in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, um, something new happened. There was a new breed of uh, self-described leftists that came out of that, that shifted the focus from um, economic and uh, or economic power injustices to things more based on identity. Um, and that was a significant transformation. And when you see how Wall Street um, and the corporate world entered that arena, they basically saw an opportunity um, in this shift of narrative. So basically by embracing those same values, um, they could more or less shed their negative image and present themselves as kind of virtuous champions of social justice. And it was a great strategic maneuver, um, more or less to you know regain, regain public trust and legitimacy. You know, all they had to do was check some diversity boxes, you know, appoint some women to boards, um, you know, showcase their commitment to inclusivity one way or another, and uh, you know they were good to go. They all of a sudden could take on the side of uh, social justice, so so to speak. Um, and I think that they couldn't have been happier. It was a godsend. And so you kind of created this whole unholy alliance, I think, where you know there is a, a condition um, for the uh, corporations. Uh, the new left had to turn a blind eye to their market power. Um, they had to ensure that the, that the dominance uh, was unchallenged um, of their um, you know, economic system. And so, you know, like I said, that was the unholy alliance between the Wall Street um, and kind of like the woke millennial uh, cultural trend that, that kind of birthed this whole kind of woke capitalism. Um, and, you know, that neutralized the whole Occupy idea of, uh, you know, ec economic change and it redirected that narrative towards, you know, these other ideals. Yeah, just, just to jump off on that. Like you said, like, you know, wokeism and identity politics have been a godsend to the capitalist elite, um, not just in terms of like their public image, you know, as being like, the, you know, the the champions of, of this like new morality, um, but also just in terms of it being good for business. Um, but but they can only do that or they were only able to do that like once they psychologically started to, you know, to break down the trends and desires of this, this like new category of, of other directed person that started like, you know, cropping up in the West after the rise of the beat generation. And then of course, further like, you know, the, uh, the hippie generation. 
because at first like they didn't understand the psychological makeup of this new type of person like they didn't follow predictable patterns as consumers they didn't care about the larger like prevailing trends of consumer capitalism at the time you know this new category of person was about being true to themselves and like individual self-expression but um you know, once once the capitalist elite figured out um, or like cracked, you know, the, the psychological motivations of these people, they were able to weaponize their desires and, um, you know, create whole new categories of junk to market to people, you know, that fit their like oh so unique <laughs> needs. And um, eventually you see this this trend encroaching upon the realm of social justice. Because, you know, the elite saw that the the other directed consumer cared about social issues. So what did they do? They began to market their products as contributing to social causes like like capitalism, which is a, a completely amoral um, enterprise, at least on the surface. Um, you know, they, they saw that they could accumulate more capital by playing their morality game. So it's like, you know, even if there was money to be made in silencing social causes or like invalidating people's identities, they would, they would do just that because the profit, the profit motive is, is what rules, not any sort of like feigned morality. Um, you know, like they really, they can give a shit about people's causes all in all. It's, it's just good for business. Um, and this actually reminds me of an interview by, uh, by Disney CEO, Bob Iger. I think that's how you, how you say his last name. Um, and this was in 2018. It was about uh, the movie Black Panther, which was like one of the original um, chances that that capitalists took um, on, on these issues of social justice. And uh, talking about Black Panther in this interview, he had to say, uh, and, and I quote, he said, I felt that it was time for Marvel storytelling to much better reflect the world we were doing business in. I'm a big believer in that, whether you call that diversity or inclusion, but the bottom line is doing so is good for commerce. So he really doesn't beat around the bush here. Like he, he makes it clear that that diversity inclusion or whatever is, is basically just noise. It doesn't have any fundamental ethical roots. Like he says clear as day that, that the bottom line is that doing so is good for commerce. Like IE, it makes them a shit ton of money. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, there's really so much to say here, and I, I guess I can't help myself but to, to share some thoughts. Um, but that, yeah, that statement by Bob Iger really gets to the heart of the math of the matter. Like diversity, equity, and inclusion, divorced from meaningful, um, like a meaningful class framework, is really no threat to capital. In fact, it's more than less. It's 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 more than not a threat. It's an opportunity to uh, to profit. <laughs> yeah, by playing more to, markets. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just a bigger market. Um, it, you know, uh, it, it keeps the zombie lumbering along, and there's a lot of money to be made there. Um, man, that Black Panther movie that sucked so bad. It felt like it was an active and purposeful slap into. The, a slap in the face of the actual Black Panther party, which was a very class oriented, you know, uh, movement, w which had its contradictions and, and its, its limitations to some extent, but nevertheless, it was like, it was a huge, you know, it was, it, it was, there's a lot to be learned from that movement and what Marvel did to, to it in Disney, uh, is, is really desecrated. The, yeah. It, neuter it neuterized it. Yeah, and um, oh, it's, it's such agree. a farce. It, it, well, the, my main issue with it was that on the surface, oh, great, you know, positive, powerful black representation, um, you know, in relation to how things used to be, that's progress. But if you dig beneath the surface, the story is this um, this black society uh, un or has access to a material resource, which is the source of all their success. So it basically outsources all the cultural values 
and economic and, 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 and sociological values that are positive and optimizing for uh, human beings in general and, and, and black people in particular. That narrative could have been conveyed, but instead it was, no, it was this material resource. It's like, oh, geological luck, you know, and it, I think is disempowering. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that movie had, uh, had a lot of problems with it, but g- generally it, 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 it seemed to serve like it kind of played into this notion of like this, like Galt's Gulch, like, uh, you know, uh, free market paradise, you know, <laughs> and they're like, we need you and we need you. What was it? Unobtainium was the material in that movie. I don't know if anybody saw it. Uh, no, that's not unobtainium. I, I forget what it was called. It was, it was some material. It might have been un- unobtainium, but it was just farcical the way they they drew on it. And the character, the kind of bad guy who was like this revolutionary character, but who was kind of a little brutal, like what was his name? Kill, kill something or other. Anyway, God, that movie. You know, at at at, um, at Adidas, they actually celebrate that movie and. Um, <laughs> you know uh, um i was just telling phoenix before we started the show that you know um they they these companies speak to the issues that that working people care about uh, especially materially but they never that they rarely take the meaningful steps of actually addressing them systematically because that's going to cut into their quarterly earnings like yeah. for example in 2018, they were releasing shirts that were talking about how like Latina workers um, were making about, you know, some, somewhere around like 68 cents on the dollar, you know, um, you know, fast forward to now, these same Latina workers at the company are still contracted out, you know, and they're still making generally very little, like, you know, maybe Maybe that's not exactly 68 cents, but the systematic um, kind of like isolation that they face as contracted workers and and the relative pay they make, that issue is still there. So so what? They pointed that fact out on a T-shirt. They just use that to trade in clout and kind of um, uh, launder their morality through it by speaking to the issue, but without doing anything meaningful about it, that kind of sums up all these fortune 500 companies and how the, the, like the woke turn that they've made, you know, I think launder morality is a great way to put it. Um, and that points to then a deeper issue, which is that not only is it not the progressive force that people think it is, it's not a neutral force. It is actually, and I said this before too, it is a degenerative force upon true progress because it is so fracturing, right? Yeah. Because the energy that would have been guided towards genuine systematic improvements are then redirected, which is in the service of the status quo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, the sub- subversive effects of postmodernism as it relates to modern concepts of academic social justice uh, has a stifling effect on humanity's progress and optimization. So that, that takes us to our next question. Uh, going back to some of the questions we addressed in the previous podcast, um, what is the notion of imminentize the Eshkan? What are its theological underpinnings and what role has the concept played in left movements? Yeah, so, so last week we started to, to challenge this notion, um, emphasized, of course, by the right, you know, being, being rooted in the, the Judeo-Christian tradition that the left is basically like a group of, of godless heathens. And of course, you know, contributing to that, you have like this Marxist emphasis on materialism Um, and, uh, this notion of like a positivist, um, scientistic mechanistic understanding of society. And then of course, not to mention the atrocities of, of like Mao's China or or Stalin's USSR, 
which of course makes the right get up on their moral high horse. Even though, of course, there were more tragedies done in the name of the Abrahamic religions than, than any of these secular left movements combined were able to muster. But um, but yeah, but anyway, anyway we started to, to chip away at this idea, not only from a historical perspective, but also as like an existential desire and need that, that people have for meaning and purpose. Like as much as people like to say we're these these meaningless biological robots, every single person, it doesn't matter who, it could even be the staunchest believer in, in this nihilistic um, purposelessness. They try to fill that void in some way, shape, or form. And I think I think Marwan, um, you said this this last week. It's like a, I'm not sure how you phrase it, but I think you said it's like an existential compulsion of sorts that that sort of haunts people. And um, I, I think a good way for the left or for people on the left, I should say, to get back in touch with with notions of like ultimate meaning or purpose, or, or any of these big loaded concepts that have, that have really seemed to go um, out of fashion in, in, in recent years, is to get back in touch with some of the theological underpinnings of the Marxist tradition, which might seem like an interesting thing to say um, to a lot of people out there. Like, how does Marx and theology, like, go together, right? Um, so I think a good way to do this is to dive a bit deeper into the um, the theological and political concept of immanentize the eschaton. And uh, th- this is a really huge topic, and we're really um, uh, <laughs> opening up a, a big can of worms with this one. And realistically, like we're not going to be able to get into to everything in this episode. But um, And we'll probably end up making an episode dedicated to this topic. But I figured um, that since, since Phoenix brought it up last week, we can at least start start the conversation um, and and get a better understanding of what it means and its spiritual implications and maybe even hint at like a renewed spiritual um, impetus for the left, which which is a tall order, but, but hopefully we'll be able to start to kind of sketch out what that would, what that would look like. But Phoenix actually summed it up quite nicely when he said um, in, in regards to imminentize the eschaton, that it means that the kingdom of heaven is a place on earth rather than some place um, you go to in the beyond, like, like in the, the orthodox understanding um, of heaven in, the, in, in the, the Christian tradition. Like, it's imminent. It's in, it's in the here and now. Um, or, or rather, I, um, I, I guess a better way to say it is that it's made imminent through human action and, and, and human ingenuity, rather than it being some transcendent, like, you know, uh, divine metaphysical abstraction. Um, but but the term itself is actually used um, a majority of the time as a pejorative by by Christian conservatives, and there there is this conservative group in the '60s. I, I can't remember um, their name at the moment, but their slogan was "Don't imminentize the eschaton," meaning like is that William F. Buckley? It might have been. Yeah. I, I can't I can't think of his name. I can't think of his name off the yeah, top of my head. Yeah, it was like head. a catchphrase of his. I think. I think. Yeah, it might have been a catchphrase of, of multiple groups. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But but the meaning of that slogan, like, don't imminentize the eschaton, it, it means, like, don't try and do God's work for him or, or, or don't try and play God. Like, only God can bring about the end times in heaven, not human beings. Like, like don't think that you can, you could rebuild the Tower of Babel because, you know, as the Bible has shown, it always ends in catastrophe, like, or whatever. But... The word eschaton is a theological concept, and like some some listeners may have heard of the term eschatology, which is like, which in theology it's it's the examination or the study of scripture relating to like God's ultimate plan for the end times, or or um, the apocalypse or apocalypticism, and it's it's theology as it applies to history, right? Like. History is moving towards some cataclysmic endpoint at which things are going to be entirely transformed according to God's plan, right? So I'm going to place emphasis here on end times and and, and history, and uh, just notice the similarity to the term the end of history, which is a concept that that I'm sure we're eventually going to go over um, in much more detail. But, but the end of history is a term very familiar to a lot of, a lot of Marxists. 
Um, and I think many in the Marxist tradition, even if they're not already familiar with the term imminentize the eschaton or, or the end of history, at least have some sort of understanding of what it means. Because, you know, in Marxism, you have this idea that, that human society and history has a trajectory and an end point. That, that end point, of course, being like freedom in an, uh, in an economic sense, like in a communist utopia of sorts. But, but Marx more or less attributes this to like logical contradictions within capitalism, you know, that sort of drives capitalism to eventually be overcome um, or, or rather, I should say, you know, to overcome and subsume itself and like innate within capitalism is the seed of its eventual like overcoming. So, you know, this idea of these these historical contradictions working themselves out towards like this utopian endpoint is more or less a secularized version of imminentize the eschaton or, or bringing the kingdom of, of heaven on earth. So I, I guess the question that we need to ask here is, is what imminentize the eschaton, you know, like a fundamentally religious idea, you know, since it's dealing with, with, with the end times, so to speak, has to do with Marxism and the left. And uh, the answer to this question lies in the thought of Hegel, you know, Mar- Marx's, Marx's teacher and, and, and greatest inspiration. So, you know, we're not going to get into Hegel's philosophy here because that's that's a beast that we'll probably try and tackle another time. But I wanted to bring up a book by Hegel um, by an author called Glenn Alexander McGee. And he wrote a book called Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition. Um, and, and really, I think this is a good book. Really, I think it's a, it's a key to understanding Hegel as not just someone who's, who's engaged in dialogue with like the overall um, Western philosophical tradition, but also as, you know, um, a religious and a spiritual thinker who's deeply rooted in, in a quite unexpected place, you know, like namely the underground spiritual currents of hermeticism and Gnosticism. And like this idea of Hegel as a hermeticist or, or a magus who used, you know, opaque alchemical jargon is a, is a pretty foreign concept to a lot of people, including, you know, a, a lot of not just Marxists, but, but Hegelians in general. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, Marx's entire uh, um, idea of historical determinism is deeply rooted in um, hermetic and Gnostic theological concepts. It's just been divorced from these roots, you know, due to Marx, like standing Hegel on his head, as he himself said, or like um, this tendency by Marxists and other thinkers to like, retroactively read Hegel from a dialectical materialist perspective, um, which kind of obfuscates a, a lot of the points that that Hegel, you know, was making. So I, I think um, there's a deep need for the Marxist left and, and the left in general to, to, to kind of get back in touch with its roots um, in a way, you know, by, by going back to Hegel and understanding his his philosophical and political project is, is fundamentally spiritual in nature and not in, in the traditional sense that, you know, you may assume. Like, we're not talking about orthodox theology here. We're talking about a very radical um, Gnostic and hermetic theology that has um, a completely different conception of God and the human being's relationship to God. And uh, how this opens the door to like a completely new way of conceptualizing God and the world and a completely new way of thinking about meaning and purpose. And of course, you know, um, uh, the, the political implications of that. So I've, I've kind of gone on for a long time, so I'm going to wrap it up. But I, I just wanted to leave it at uh, I want to leave it at a quote by Hegel where he said, um, the true state is the ethical whole and the realization of freedom. It is the absolute purpose of reason that freedom should be realized. The state is the march of God through the world. Its ground is the power of reason realizing itself as will. That's brilliant. Um, really excellent comments there, Devin. There's really a lot of jumping off points for me uh, in, in terms of you know how I want to, you know, like what that what inspiration that gives me. It kind of brings me to this idea of another way to kind of conceive of this um, 
is a you know yes immunitize the eschaton but it, the other way to conceive of this is kind of how we've addressed this in previous episodes like i remember phoenix talked about the whole of maslow's hierarchy you know dealing with the upper rungs of that hierarchy of needs and i think another way further still to think about this is the question of envisioning a utopia you know like i think on the left we um there's a lot of kind of like oh you know that uh, thinking about utopia is is this kind of masturbatory kind of exercise it's getting mm. way ahead of ourselves like we'll yeah. deal with a we'll deal with social alienation after the revolution mm -hmm. so it's like we need to deal with alienation here and now actually to to give people the confidence that our movement is the one to support you know mm -hmm. because people are living their alienation every single day and and and, and neoliberalism is trying to speak to their alienation and giving them lifestyle politics and trying to run interference with DEI without class, uh, you know, in order to satisfy their kind of uh, existential alienation. Uh, in other words, like we need utopianism on the left uh, in order to kind of complete the uh, full hierarchy of needs there and to really make a, the strongest cell the most comprehensive cell about about why we have the answers um there's this article that was uh, that dropped in jacobin magazine um uh by frederick jameson very recently frederick jameson on why socialists need utopias and it's really an excellent article but i just wanted to read off this excerpt um let me just find the um uh yeah, to think utopia in some practically meaningful way requires us to include the problem of cultural revolution within our theory. You know, mm. so mm -hmm. so the, the the idea there is that um, you know we need to address not only a, a revolution in terms of redistribution of wealth and the cementing of like opportunity for working class people and like mo like not only social mobility but that that mobility also needs to get into the question of like what it means to be a person to like mm -hmm. achieve um uh freedom in the in the positive liberty sense and, and that gets right back to that hegel quote that you just shared for me it's interesting um if you think about it, the, the topic of eschaton is really taking any ideology to its nth degree, to its final conclusion. Um, so there's different versions of what we could consider eschaton. Um, basically, to me, the way I look at it is every mode of the human condition, um, any way that we organize ourselves sociologically, culturally, psychologically, structurally, systemically, um, it, it, that's all a flux um, and that constantly evolving mode it, it proceeds to its uh, logical conclusion um, and that ultimately means either uh, you know a destruction from opposing forces um, uh, an internal collapse or uh, you know the actual manifestation of that ideology is kind of a degree uh, so then really what we have to look at is what's the best version of that you know um, you guys mentioned some another one is Francis Fukuyama's liberal uh, eschaton right the idea that um, you know the the world circa 1990 give or take and what that was going to potentially look like as an extension of that forever um, you know that that form of liberalism was going to be the final system um, and that obviously is not true so what is the best version of an eschaton? What is the what is the best nth degree? That's how we can kind of reverse engineer um, what to Im magnetize. Um, and you know, obviously, you know, as we we've we've said over and over, it's developing a uh, an optimized kind of psyche, sociology, um, mode of relating to each other, mode of of thinking and using our minds, and kind of all else flows from that. 
um, so systemically um, uh, institutionalizing engineering society towards achieving those ends is kind of how to do that. And I love the word amanitize, by the way. I think that um, it's powerful because it's about making imminent, in other words, going from vision to reality. Um, kind of a, a way to look at it is that applies in the way we're talking about it on the collective level, but you know, as above, so below on the, on the individual level, you know, think about, you know, self-help <laughs> gurus, you know, uh, creating a vision of uh, a vision board and focusing on what you want in life and, and putting your effort and will towards that and kind of becoming more successful as an individual as a result. So great. But collectively, when we use synergy and then you visualize and you achieve with a uh, fo focused effort collective, uh, collectively through a state that, um, you know, administers those ends intelligently, um, you know, that's how you can achieve society, a society that's effective and, um, you know, well-designed uh, towards positive ends. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, well, uh, uh, that, that leads me to another um, kind of quote in that article by Frederick Jameson on, on you know, why socialists need utopias. Um, and uh, put another way, the quote is, cultural revolution is the superstructure of which the party is the infrastructure. I think that's kind of like another way of conceiving things like what is going to put us over the edge as a movement it's by having like a compelling cultural vision in which people can derive meaning and completion on a higher order you know um and i think that that will put us kind of over the edge like uh, you know like i can't help but think of um emil durkheim in um in his kind of uh analysis of of like why people you know take the the fateful and unfortunate step of like committing suicide and durkheim really you know he doesn't address this question on the individual basis he addresses this question socially you know he says um suicide is kind of like a a, 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 individual's response to social failure. And, and that's me mm. just putting it in the most broadest strokes possible. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a social phenomena. Yeah, it's a social phenomena. It's not just a me material social phenomena, although there's no doubt that material, uh, want exacerbates these sort of things, but it's really just this, like, it's this response to kind of nihilism and meaningless, like, this writ large that that uh, especially motivates these sort of things and and i think um you know meaning injected into a movement that's compelling and complete um that addresses higher order questions um like religion purports to do um seems like it would be a, a profound antidote to the kind of mass alienation that we feel and like as as leftists as socialists as people who want a better world we cannot relegate it to quote unquote after the revolution we need to address address that alienation in the here and now and you know i think these questions of imminentizing the eschaton or like looking at hegel and and philosophers that really uh that dare to kind of explore that is really the key. And, and I think Marxists need to, you know, need to revisit that. And I think I also agree that like um, Hegel and the Hermetic tradition is, is also a big key into understanding Hegel. I mean, Hegel is famously the most difficult philosopher uh, of all time to plug through and understand. And if you get this like Mandarin kind of academic analysis into Hegel, you might, you might, get the idea that he's just like um like i don't know like a, a a difficult version to understand of like kant and 
that wouldn't do him any justice. Um, or you might just think that he's just being obtuse and doing word salad and then you might just dismiss him or you might take marks at his word that like oh he he fixed hegel he put him on his head he was upside down and then that's that there's there's nothing meaningful to actually like address uh in, in hegel's philosophy um, yeah yeah there's this there's this notion in um in in certain circles in academia that that hegel was a non-metaphysical philosopher which is really, really funny to me. I mean, they have, of course, they have their arguments and stuff to back it up. But, but yeah, by reading Hegel and the, the, the Hermetic tradition, you really see that like the roots of his thought are profoundly spiritual and religious and, and metaphysical. You know, they, ha- they have meta- metaphysical presuppositions kind of baked into it about like the nature of God and, 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 and um, the nature of, of the human being's relationship to God and, and the political implications of that and, and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's something that, that needs to be revisited in a lot of ways. And, and I think there's ripe territory to do that, you know, by, by kind of going back to Hegel. And, and, of course, Hegel was a product of his time. You know, things have moved on in a lot of ways. Um, you know, um, our science in general has progressed and he is a product of his time, but th- there is a lot to mine there, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And, and, you know, the Marxist humanist tradition thinks so as well. I mean, Zizek is always on about how, you know, Marxists went from Hegel to Marx and, and we need to go back to Hegel again. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I definitely think there's a lot of merit and value in exploring that. Well, let's uh, transition to our kind of last question that we kind of want to address. And this is another can of worms of sorts. Um, but, you know, we kind of addressed this before, but we kind of want to visit it again to dive in, uh, into it a little more. Uh, and the question to address is who, who are the non-liberal left? How do we ascertain them? And why is it important to distinguish between various currents on the left? And um, I will begin to address this question, um, but I will also admit that uh, the question about who exactly the non-liberal left are and, and, and uh, how we ascertain them is kind of a two-parter. And we're going to dive more into that into the next episode, and I'll speak more to that uh, at the end. But um, uh, so, yeah, so, so to address this, the non-liberal left has myriad ideological strands out of a similar route, varying methodologies and different operating principles at times. Given this reality, unifying these disparate strands seems like a tall order. Today, we want to go over these questions as a means of assessing it broadly to drive at the point that we ultimately cannot lazily categorize the left And furthermore, we must understand these distinctions in order to actually cut through the noise and impel broad sections of the advanced left to come together behind a vision, strategy, and a program. So in looking at the relatively advanced layers of the mostly illiberal left, we have endless strands of Marxism to navigate through. It is important to state that when we say Marxist, we don't mean necessarily that adherence to the general thrust of Marxist political theory and treat Marx as a prophet with dictates and dogmas. Indeed, some may harbor this attitude, but nevertheless, we mean socialists, leftists, communists, and political agents who take on board a broadly class-central political analysis, a la Marxism, um, who endeavor to increase consciousness of class dynamics in the working class and their followers in order to challenge the social dominance of private interest and place in its stead the common interest of the people, both socially and materially. So before we get to a full answer about who the illiberal left are, we have to have a strong understanding of why it's important to meaningfully distinguish between various currents on the left. In our project, we place high importance in this for simple reasons, namely that we can't have any hope in uniting advanced layers of the left without understanding this territory well. 
related, we can't make an appeal to the universalist demands of unity without understanding the valid distinct uh, distinctions in theory, praxis, and outlook of various advanced layers either. This aim of navigating, mapping the territory of the advanced layers of the left for the purpose of understanding is crucial if we're to have any hope of uniting the left, challenging the dominance of liberalism, and birthing a mass politics that begins to actually move the masses in their own interests. Without moving the immediate intermediate layers of the left who are not deep in their understanding, who have instincts to rely on as much as their analysis, will never have any hope in achieving a critical mass as a political movement in society. 10% of the population in the United States in 2023 is roughly 34 to 35 million people. That's how many people a movement would have to win to a program in order to contend and win like in, in the broadest strokes socially. The intermediate layers of the left, along with um, along with disengaged proletarian mal- uh, masses, are those who must be appealed to for the left to win. Without some meaningful unity and vision for advanced layers, the leaders, uh, their leaders, r- rely on the instincts of the intermediate and disaffected proletarians, and those instincts will betray the best hopes of the advanced. This brings me to the concept of the mass line. In socialist politics, especially Maoist revolutionary politics, the mass line is, broadly speaking, the notion of uniting the advanced, winning over the intermediate, and isolating the worst of the backwards. Diving in a little deeper, this concept forces us to to deal with the question of leadership as well. From the advanced layers, what kind of leadership must be endeavored in to stoke the masses' confidence? Leadership from advanced layers hoping to bring on board participation and confidence from the masses need a sense of not only real-time credibility, but a two-way dialectical means of speaking to the issues of the masses and assisting in analysis of the issues that plague them. This means not only leading, but crucially listening. This also means learning together and summing up lessons together. The people often choose their leaders and and, and a leader that speaks speaks only at the masses and never with the masses don't readily win the confidence of those being led. This two-way street relationship develops an organic bond that can withstand challenges. What does that look like in this day and age with the prevalence of social media? In other words, can we build credibility and confidence as would-be leaders posting on Twitter or issuing screeds on Facebook walls or turning our cameras on ourselves and sharing stories on Instagram? I don't think any of the aforementioned are meaningful ways of engaging in the principles of mass line politics. There is no collective summation. It's a one-way street and as such, is much like pissing against a wind. So understanding the strategy of the mass line is meaningful and reliable as a way of actually stoking organic bonds and credibility and cementing leadership in the most compelling manner we can conceive of. This is inherently a very offline endeavor. The extremely online nature of the modern world is simply not conducive to the strategy, and intermediate layers as a result, remain in the wasteland of liberal politics and the neoliberal, quote, end of history, which we referenced earlier. Um, And this end of history remains thick on the horizon of possibilities. Going back to the initial question of understanding the more advanced layers of the left, we need to understand a series of important concepts. What is ultra-leftism? What is ultra-liberalism? What is left communism? Is it an infantile disorder? What is Trotskyism? In liberalism, ultra-leftism, or mass action by Peter Cameo, we have a framework by which we can start to understand the aforementioned questions. In the article, broadly, uh, Cameo addresses whether we can to elites, 
i.e. small groups of activists, or we can, or if we can look to the power of millions of working people to, to build a better world. So, um, you know, listeners, in the next episode of our podcast, we will begin to analyze together these two articles to more deeply map out the territory of the advanced and intermediate layers of the left. And those articles are Liberalism, Ultra-Leftism, or Mass Action by Peter Camejo, and Ultra-Liberalism, The Dominant Tendency of the American Left by Ramsey Cannon. And yeah, we, we could also post these in the in the show notes too. Oh, absolutely. If people want to yeah, read we'll, along. We'll post it in the show notes, no doubt. But um, before we kind of outro, if uh, you know my co-hosts have any comments to make, we can we can address those now. Um, I mean, I, th- I think you summed it up quite well, and it's it's just that like if we want to have a successful left movement, we have to be able to distinguish between different left currents, you know, like not everybody who says they're a leftist, even if they're not liberal, you know, we, we still need to be able to understand what, what they're about, like where, where they're coming from. And, um, so that we could be able to, um, better unite the left. Cause that's really, you know, one of the goals, uh, goals of this podcast is to, you know, diagnose the problems, um, and figure out a way and etch out a way forward for the left so that we can, we can unite the left and, and, um, the working class to, to take on power. And, um, yeah, this, this, uh, these articles that we'll be posting and that we'll be discussing next week is going to be really important, I think, um, to, uh, yeah, to, to being able to distinguish that and make those distinctions. Absolutely. Well said. Okay, well, listeners, thank you so much. This has been The Wasteland and the Mountain signing off. Thank you for tuning into our third episode. Please subscribe and join us for future episodes where we dive deeply into the concepts, ideas, great intellects, and thinkers of the class conscious left. Until next time, listeners, thank you. Thank you.